Religious freedom in America is under fire. Actually, it is even worse than that. The bottom line is that a war has been declared on Christianity in this nation. In the years ahead, every possible attempt is going to be made to confine Christianity to church buildings. For a presentation by a person who is fighting on the front lines to defend Christian liberties, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. The theme of our 2015 annual Bible conference was Messages for a Rebellious Nation. We had six outstanding speakers at the conference, and one of them was Kelly Shackelford, the founder and director of the Liberty Institute located in Plano, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. This is the largest law firm in the nation that is devoted solely to the defense of Christian liberties. Kelly's specific topic was Religious Freedom Under Fire, an update from the front lines. And folks, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that what he had to share came as a great shock to our audience. By the time he finished speaking, it was clear to everyone that we are engaged in a war against Christianity and we had better sit up and take notice. As you view his presentation, please keep in mind that he made it just two weeks after our nation's Supreme Court had legalized same-sex marriage. Here now is Kelly Shackelford. And you know, one of the things I try to do, I speak in a lot of groups, uh, and, and a lot of times I speak, it's not a group like this. It's a group of people who know the Lord and, a peop and of people who don't have a faith at all. Uh, and so, to them they ask the question, and so this might help you as you talk to your friends who maybe aren't, uh, haven't come to know the Lord. Why should they care about religious freedom, or should they care? And the answer is yes, and there are a lot, a lot of reasons. Our founders wrote about this a lot. I mean, this is our first freedom. They understood that if you lose this freedom, you'll, you'll lose all your freedoms. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how many people from Eastern European countries have come up to me after I've talked and said, I'm not a person of faith at all, but I totally agree with what you're doing. I saw this happen in my country. When religious freedom goes, then all your freedoms are about to leave. And I want to show you one quick 90 second video that again any person, whether they're a person of faith at all, I think will get the point of why religious freedom is so important to our country. Some time ago, I had a conversation with a Marxist economist from China. He was coming to the end of a Fulbright Fellowship here in Boston. And I asked him if he had learned anything that was surprising or unexpected. And without any hesitation, he said, yeah, I had no idea how critical religion is to the functioning of democracy. The reason why democracy works, he said, is not because the government was designed to oversee what everybody does. But rather, democracy works because most people, most of the time, voluntarily choose to obey the law. And in your past, most Americans attended a church or a synagogue every week, and they were taught there by people who they respected. My friend went on to say that Americans followed these rules because they had come to believe that they weren't just accountable to society, they were accountable to God. My Chinese friend heightened a vague but nagging concern I've harbored inside that as religion loses its influence over the lives of Americans, what will happen to our democracy? Where are the institutions that are gonna teach the next generation of Americans that they too need to voluntarily choose to obey the laws? Because if you take away religion, you can't hire enough police. So that being the case, this being very important, how are we doing on religious freedom? Um, again, I don't think most people are uh, in the dark on this at this point. I mean, we've got uh, pastors having their, their, their sermon subpoenaed, not in Massachusetts or somewhere, in Houston. 
right? We've got, uh, I mean, if you watch, every day you'll see something. We just do a survey. This is our survey for last year of all the attacks uh, on religion. There's about six or seven a page, and you can see this is everything from a uh, seven-year-old boy who was caught praying over his meal and physically lifted out of his seat and taken to the principal's office and told to never do that again while he was at school, to senior citizens who were actually told that their federally funded meals were going to be taken away from them because they were praying over their meals and that would violate separation of church and state. It's in the north, it's in the south, it's people of wealth, it's people who are poor. It's, there's literally, if you go through this, you'll realize how pervasive this is. Um, and uh, this is a real issue. This is a real battle. And, and uh, it's, uh, we've had years, we do this every year. We've had years literally where it's doubling from one year to the next and how the increase. But it continually is increasing in the hostility and the attacks. And when you realize religious freedom is the first freedom, that this tells you, you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, when we had old cars, we used to have a little red light on the dashboard. And when that light came on, it was telling you that you were low on oil, and if you didn't do something, your engine was going to throw a rod or, or freeze up. Uh, that's what this is a sign of for our country. This is a sign that our country is in danger when you see this kind of attacks and the ever-increasing numbers on religious freedom. Now, that would be bad enough uh, if we didn't have the Supreme Court decision we just had uh, recently. And, you know, the big debate now, or not debate really, but the, what the other side tries to pretend is, oh, well, this won't have any impact on religious freedom. And that's, that's the average American thinks, well, what does marriage have to do with me? You know, those, those two men or two women can go get married. It's not going to affect me. Oh, yes, it is going to affect you. Um, and well, why would you say that? I'll just tick off a few examples. Uh, tax exempt status of every religious organization is now going to be under attack. And you say, oh, you know, how could you say that? Well, I didn't say it. The Solicitor General of the United States said it during the oral argument at the Supreme Court on this case. They asked him, they said, look, if we, if we do this decision and create this same-sex marriage as a constitutional right, then how can we allow people to have tax-exempt status if they're you know, discriminating against that right? And, you know, you thought the Solicitor General would say, oh, we're not going to go after everybody's tax-exempt status. No, the answer of the Solicitor General of the United States was, quote, that will be an issue. Okay? And it, it took, I think, 24 hours for Time Magazine to come out with their editorial after the decision saying religious groups need to give up their tax-exempt status if they have beliefs on marriage being a man and a woman. But that's just the beginning. I mean, you know, you can look at other countries that have done this and... Uh, you think, well, okay, uh, let's say I don't, I don't really care about my church or any of the religious groups that have tax exempt status. Uh, they won't affect me in other ways. Well, do you listen to the radio? Do you watch TV? Uh, well, how can you let people have an FCC license if they're engaging in discrimination against people in light of this new Supreme Court case? I mean, look at Canada. You are not allowed to speak out against, uh, you know, gay marriage on the air. Ask Dr. Dobson. Every time his shows were carried in Canada, they, they couldn't be carried on those issues. Okay? And I can guarantee you that if you have a pastor or a ministry or somebody who's now you're listening to on the radio or TV, I can't tell you they're going to lose. I sure hope they won't lose. We're going to fight with the Constitution at our back. But will there be an attack against everyone who holds those licenses or who has someone on that has those views? Absolutely there's going to be a, an attack. Um, what if you're a Christian college? It's already started. Uh, there are already calls for Christian colleges uh, who have uh, tax-exempt status that they need to have housing for gay couples. You know, if they've got married housing, they have to, they can't be discriminatory. Um, I mean, we could go down a long list of things. I, you've seen all the, probably the, the news about the bakers, the florists, the, the um, photographers who are actually being persecuted out of business. Uh, the most recent one, of course, that's getting a lot of attention are the two, ba uh, the husband and wife that are bakers from Oregon who simply said they couldn't, you know, they'd be happy to make a cake for these people. In fact, they did before, but they couldn't make a wedding cake for two women because that would have them participating in a wedding and that would violate their faith. Uh, well, right now, uh, not only has their business been bankrupted, uh, but they have a $135,000 fine uh, for sticking to their religious beliefs. And the order also ordered them not to speak 
about their beliefs in a way that, that would express any uh, discrimination against sexual orientation. So literally they, they wouldn't be able to speak and say marriage is a man and a woman. Uh, now that's continuing to go. It's got another appeal, but these are the kind of things that are happening. You've got uh, Baron L. Stutzman, 72-year-old grandmother. She's actually being now prosecuted because she wouldn't do a flower arrangement for two men in their wedding. She would sell them flowers. She loved them. She said, I can't arrange the flowers. Then I'm, I'm giving my expression to support something that my Lord says is not, is not marriage. Um, so she's not only looking at the last decision in that case was not only is her business now at jeopardy, but they've said that she's going to be personally liable and they can come after her home. Okay, a 72 year old grandmother because she wouldn't do a flower arrangement. Now I could keep going through these cases, but the point is there are a lot of these attacks and the thing that should bring it home to everybody is I ask people, well you think this isn't going to affect you. Um, have you ever thought about what's going to happen in all the professions? They said, what do you mean? I said, do you think, you know, all professions have ethics codes, they have codes of conduct. Do you think that this issue isn't going to be brought into those codes of conduct? And it's not going to be a question of, well, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or a real estate agent or a psychologist or you, you just keep going down the line, then you can't have these type of discriminatory views. You've got to sign this statement. I mean, you're literally talking about people uh, maybe losing their profession. You might think, well, that's pretty radical. It's already happening. We've already got cases on this. Uh, so now with this Supreme Court case, you think it's not going to be even more energized. This is going to impact every person in this country. And these attacks are going to come in all of these different arenas, trying to use this to violate people's religious freedom. And I'm not saying we're going to lose those battles, but what I'm saying is, we're going to have those battles now. And uh, a lot of people say, you know, they saw the decision and they're very down and depressed and they think, golly, it's over. And my really perspective as a guy who does religious freedom is the battle is literally just beginning. Yes. We are now deciding as a country whether we're going to keep religious freedom as our first freedom. The reason people came here is they left because they weren't allowed to hold their religious beliefs uh, that were different from the government. They came here because here was a place you could dissent, you could disagree, you could hold to your religious conscience and not be punished by the government. And now everything I just went through with you are examples of the government trying to punish people for having different beliefs on marriage. Okay, we, this, to me this is in the DNA of the American people as much as anything. The idea, the right to dissent, to disagree with the government especially on a matter of conscience and faith. And so the battle really here is just beginning, but it is a battle. For those of you who may have tuned in late, let me explain that you are watching a presentation by Kelly Shackelford that was made at our last Bible conference. The theme of the conference was Messages for a Rebellious Nation. Kelly is the founder and director of the Liberty Institute, which is the largest law firm in the nation that is devoted solely to the defense of Christian liberties. Let's return now to Kelly as he starts talking about the assaults on Christian liberties that are taking place in the military today. Uh, you know, two years ago we had three areas. We said religious freedom, we're, we're here to protect and to restore religious freedom in our schools, for our churches, and in the public arena. Well now if you look we have four. We had to open a whole uh, flank just for the military because of what was going on. And I think most people have seen the cases where they're going after all the veterans memorials that have religious imagery like a cross. Um, probably the first one of these was our case was the uh, Mojave Desert Cross. It's put up in 1934 by the hands of World War I vets who had come back from the war. And, the, and it's put up in the middle of the, the desert, 1.6 million acres of desert. And it sat there for 70 years. It's just a, a lone seven foot cross with a little plaque on the bottom that said, for the dead of all wars and had their VFW post. 70 years until somebody uh, from the ACLU said, hey, we found this cross and, and brought a lawsuit to have it torn down after 70 years. Unbelievably, the Federal District Court and Court of Appeals said, tear it down. Uh, we jumped in at that point on behalf of all the major veterans groups, the American Legion, the Military Order of the Purple Heart, the uh, um, American Ex-Prisoners of War, and, we, and the VFW, and we said, uh, no, absolutely not. Now while it was on appeal, I just want to show you a picture of what the court ordered be done to that memorial. 
I mean, it's, that's a bag with a chain around the bottom with a padlock on the bottom. Um, of course, what's great is you still know it's the cross, but uh, what a picture. What a picture. I mean, you, th you look at that and you think, what is this, the, the USSR? Um, you think it's not America. Now, some people say, why do you make a big deal about this? You went to the Supreme Court, got this reversed, that cross is back up. True. Sa uh, Fox News was there with a satellite truck when the cross went back up. It was carried all over the country. We wanted the Supreme Court 5-4. Okay? You change one vote, this is the law. This picture is the law. So it just shows you how close we are and the kind of attacks that are even starting in the, at least you would say, well, at least these attacks against veterans memorials are over. No, we now have the uh, Mount Soledad cross, which has been up since the 1950s. The last order in that court was tear it down. Um, we've got a stay of that, but we're still fighting that case. The, uh, in Maryland, the peace cross that was put up literally uh, through the funds, of, yeah, that's the peace cross right there, up for 90, over 90 years, put up by mothers who lost their sons in the war. And now there's a lawsuit to tear it down because it's a cross. Um, we're seeing these you know, all across the country. We have five different ones that we're defending in different places. But the problem is these attacks aren't just on the, the outward symbols. And that is very important. If you talk to anybody who's lived in these Eastern European countries, the first thing they do is they take down the religious symbols and they put up the secular symbols. So it is very powerful and very important, but it goes much further than just the symbols. I mean, we're having this happen internally within the military. Uh, Sergeant Philip Monk, 19 and a half years in the Air Force, uh, was in Iraq, patched up over 600 people. Uh, you know, when you see guys come back without an arm or a leg, or I mean, it was Sergeant Monk who was patching those people up. Had to clean the blood of his buddies off his boots, came back to the United States for his lesbian commander to say to him, I need you to agree with me on gay marriage. And he said, look, this is the Air Force. Uh, we can have different beliefs on other things as long as we're consistent on the policies and the mission of the Air Force. He said, no, 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 I need you to tell me right now that you agree with me on gay marriage. Well, he wouldn't answer the question because he knew she wasn't going to like his answer. So she relieved him of his duties after 19 and a half years. Now, he was on the phone with us wondering, you know, look, he said, my pension vests at 20 years. I mean, my, my sons, my, my wife, I could lose everything if I oppose what's going on here. About three days later, he was having a Bible study with his three boys. And it just naturally occurred in his Bible study. And before he knew what he had said, he said to his boys, sons, you have to be willing to stand for your faith. And when he did, it just convicted him. And he picked up the phone and he called us and he said, let's go. You know, my sons are watching me. And uh, we filed a complaint. Uh, we have on staff a, a JAG, a former military uh, litigator for about 10 years in the military, taught at the Naval Academy. Did everything correct like you're supposed to. The first thing they did was read Sergeant Monk his Miranda rights and open a criminal investigation against him to try to intimidate him. Okay? Uh, he told me, he said, I'm getting all these emails and texts from people I served with in Iraq, and they're saying, Philip, I'm praying for you. Philip, I'm behind you. I just can't come out publicly. And he said, you know, I never knew any of these guys were Christians because we weren't allowed to talk about that. And that told me everything about how things had gone wrong in the military. I mean, George Washington, when he established the military, the first thing he did is gave everybody a Bible and established chaplains. Because he understood that if you don't have religious freedom in the military, you're going to have a really bad military. Because they need to be able to rely on their faith. They need that. And uh, so what's been going on there has been incredible. And uh, you know, we've got two new cases. Uh, some of you have heard about these. I mean, so Sergeant Monk, uh, the good news is it, it ended well. Uh, you know, he, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But uh, we've got two more that we don't know how they're going to end uh, that are probably ones you've heard about because they're all over the national scene. One is Chaplain Motter, Wes Motter. Guys, uh, uh, he's not only a chaplain, he's a chaplain like to the Special Forces, like SEAL Team 6. He's been deployed 14 times perfect record until all of a sudden a few months ago uh, some people complained because in one-on-one -on -one counseling he was asked about sex and what the Bible says about sex like homosexuality etc. And he talked about sex being only proper within marriage and marriage of a man and a woman which is exactly what he's an Assemblies of God pastor what he, what he should do in accordance with his faith. Uh, he's now been detached for cause, meaning he's been kicked out of his position out of 19 and a half years for being, quote, intolerant. Okay? Well, if our chaplains can't answer a biblical question with a biblical answer, 
then they're not chaplains anymore. And so this is a fight about whether we're going to have chaplains anymore in this country. Now, West Mott is standing up, and we're going to do everything we can. Uh, we're fighting all the way through the system, and then if we have to go into court after that, if the Secretary of Navy doesn't correct this, if that's what's necessary, then we'll, we'll go into court. Because they violated numerous laws when they did this to West. There, there are specific laws protecting chaplains uh, that they violated. But the point is, we're having a fight here. The last one you probably heard about is uh, Monica Sterling, who was court-martialed. And by that, I don't mean she was threatened with a court-martial. She was convicted, court-martialed, for having a scripture verse taped to the bottom of her work computer. Okay? And we're now having to appeal this to the, what's called the uh, Court of Military Appeals, which is essentially the Military Supreme Court, because the Marine Court of Appeals affirmed this said that somebody might be offended if they walked by her workstation. Yeah, these little weak Marines, I'm sure they would just be, you know, <laughs> just torn apart by her scripture verse. Uh, you know, and then in another place, in the opinion, they say, well, the Religious Freedoms Restoration Act doesn't protect her because this really wasn't a religious exercise. So it's so religious that it offends people in one part of the opinion, and then in the other part it's not religious. It's just gobbledygook, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And so we're going to the, to the highest level. We hope to get a precedent that makes clear throughout all branches of the military that religious freedom applies to them. And uh, so the military is a place we're having to fight that we didn't even used to, but it's, it is very important because if we lose the military, that's a lot of times how you lose your country. I mean, if you end up pushing people of faith and religious freedom out of the military, eventually you end up with, I'm just following orders. You end up with Hitler's SS. And you get the wrong leader and you lose a country. You lose your freedoms. So this is a very important area to battle. The last area I'd mention to you is the workplace. Um, and I, again, I could give you a lot of examples, but I just want to give you one. Uh, I think most people have heard about the Hobby Lobby case, right? Very few people know what was argued in the Hobby Lobby case. Our government, the Solicitor General of the United States, got up in front of all justices. This was their main argument and argued that once you go into for-profit business, you are making the decision to waive your religious freedoms. And quote, you now play by the government's rules. Now, they lost on that argument, but they picked up a number of votes from justices for the first time in our country. Uh, so, you know, th this is a battle now where if they can take over the workplace, they take over where people live most of their waking hours. And religious freedom is basically you know, extinguished uh, or pushed into your home and your church is where you can experience it. Now, it's not just employers, though. It's employees. We now have a whole stack of cases. We never used to have any cases like what I'm about to describe to you, and now we've got a number of them. We filed one this week. We're filing another next week. We're filing another the week after that. Cases where people are losing their jobs not because of anything they say at work or do at work, but because their employer is finding out where they go to church or what they believe and that they believe marriage is a man and a woman. And you think, well, surely not. Yeah, I could give you example after example. Uh, a lot of people know who Craig James is, uh, was uh, played at, at SMU, was All-American, ended up being uh, an All-Pro, played for the uh, New England Patriots, and then became a broadcaster. And was a broadcaster for many years until he decided to run for Congress, or actually for Senate. He ran against, you know, Ted Cruz, which didn't work out so well for him, right? Ted Cruz won. But during that race, they were asked a question. What, you know, what is your position on marriage? Well, Craig James said, I'm with God's definition. Marriage is a man and a woman, okay? So he loses the race. He decides, I'm going back into sports broadcasting. Fox Sports hires him and sends out a press release of the accolades of all of his, you know, background, what an incredible broadcaster he is, except which he is. And he got on the first night, did a great job. The next day he was fired. Why? Well, we don't have to guess because the PR head of Fox Sports said to the Dallas Morning News that it was his answer in the campaign. They found out after he was on the air because some people complained in their main office in Los Angeles that they didn't like his views of marriage, and that, quote, those kind of views won't play well in our HR department. So think about this. They fired him not because of any of his work, but because of their bigotry against his religious beliefs outside of work. Clear violation of the law. But it's not just there. We've got a guy by the name of Eric Walsh 
He was a director of public health for the city of Pasadena. State of Georgia said, we want you to be our director of public health for a whole region of the state. He accepted the job. Before he gets there, some activists from California call the Georgia State Department and say, you need to look at his beliefs and where he goes to church. We now have copies of the emails of the government officials divvying up the sermons from his church and deciding who's going to read which sermon. The next day they fired him because he believed marriage was a man and a woman. Okay? I just want you to think about this. They fired him not because of anything he did or said at work, but because of what was said in his church on Sunday. So these, you know, this is the attack. I had a friend of mine who's a barrister from the UK, and he said, you know, uh, this started happening to us about seven years ago, and we were a little slow, you know, to respond, and we lost these cases. And he said, if you lose these cases, you don't just lose these cases. Uh, you, it quickly becomes that those views are a danger to the profession. You name the profession. And then eventually people have to decide, do you want your profession uh, or would you rather be able to live out your faith? And he said about 70% of our country decided, I'll keep my profession. And he said, that's when you'll lose your country. He said, you better not just win these cases, you better inflict pain when you win these cases and send the message that this doesn't happen in the United States of America. And that's what we're trying to do, and that's what should happen. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it has been a blessing to you. Incidentally, we have presented only half of Kelly Shackelford's outstanding presentation. In a moment, our announcer will tell you how you can get a copy of the full presentation. Next week, the Lord willing, we will continue showing you excerpts from the presentations that were made at our annual Bible conference. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. The powerful presentation you have just viewed is available in its entirety in our 2015 Bible Conference video album, which contains three DVDs with six 50-minute presentations. The album is titled Messages for a Rebellious Nation, and all six of the presentations it contains are related to that theme. The album could be yours for a gift of $25 or more, including the cost of shipping. Again, the album contains three DVDs with a total of six 50-minute presentations. The specific presentations are Our New Moral Disorder by Robert Jeffress, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Our Rabid Nation by Al Gist, evangelist for Maranatha Evangelistic Ministries in DeRitter, Louisiana. We Don't Need No More Ignorant Christians by Tim Wildman, president of the American Family Association in Tupelo, Mississippi. Religious Freedom Under Fire, a report from the front lines by Kelly Shackelford, president of the Liberty Institute in Plano, Texas. Hope in the Midst of Growing Darkness by Bob Russell, former pastor of Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, and A Nation Begging for Destruction by Dave Reagan. To place your order, Call the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, or order online at our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 